In the last video on math classes for engineers and physics majors, I talked about Calc 1 through 3, as well as linear algebra and differential equations. But there are more math classes and topics you'll learn in most engineering disciplines, and definitely in the physics major. Things such as Fourier analysis, Laplace transforms, complex analysis, partial differential equations, discrete math, numerical methods, and statistics, which are going to be what this video and the next will be focused on. But note that all of these courses here are guaranteed. Pretty much regardless of what engineering discipline you're in or what school you're at, you will take these. But these are dependent on your major, but also your school. You may be required to take one of these at one school, but not at the next for the same major. But let's get into what these are, and I'll talk about what majors typically might take them. So Fourier analysis and Laplace transforms I listed first for a reason, and it's because they're very important concepts. They are two different topics, but you typically learn one after the other because they're very similar. So the basics of the Fourier analysis is that any general function can be represented as the sum of different sine or cosine functions. By just changing these values like the amplitude or frequency, you can change what function they make up. Like here's a small clip of the signal of my voice from this video that I just took a screenshot of. It's just a function, but it's obviously much crazier looking than something like x squared. But regardless of how crazy it looks, there's a way to mathematically represent it as just a bunch of sine or cosine functions added up. It wouldn't be this simple, and there would actually be an infinite amount of them added up, but it can be done. Then I could tell which frequencies make up my voice and how strong they are. I've shown this before, but if you have a sine wave, then you add another one shown in red, you'll get the wave shown in blue. As you keep adding sine waves of different frequencies and amplitudes shown in red, you can create another function, in this case a square wave, after adding more and more. Determining those amplitudes and frequencies is something you'll do and is very math intensive, so you can find out which ones make up a square wave versus some other function. But now the question is, so what? How does this help? Well, when you have the sound signal from a song, let's say, the Fourier transform can help isolate frequencies so you can see which ones are apparent. So you could see like lower frequency instruments are stronger than the higher frequency ones or something like that. That's actually what this is, which you may see when listening to a song. It's telling you the frequencies at one certain time, and Fourier analysis is the foundation for mathematically representing these. Then you can maybe make digital filters that make certain frequencies louder and others quieter, which is what an equalizer does. You can alter higher frequency instruments or lower ones if you wanted to. This manipulation is signal processing, so it's very important for majors like electrical or computer engineering. Or what about with AM and FM radio? In those, the M stands for modulation. The A and F stand for amplitude and frequency. But modulation is basically how you take the signal from the radio station and manipulate it such that you move the frequencies to a specific higher frequency, like 94.5 MHz, aka 94.5 FM. This way they don't interfere with other radio stations. Without this technique, you could not send it wirelessly. A very simple AM radio wave would look like this, and Fourier analysis is the foundation of why the signal looks like this and why this is needed. In quantum mechanics, we can only know the position and velocity of a particle with so much certainty. So since there is some uncertainty, we represent the particle as a wave which can help us determine the probability of finding it somewhere. Then the Fourier transform can help us determine things about this, such as the momentum as a very basic example. But these applications go on. You need Fourier analysis for optics and dealing with light, for sonar or radar signals, acoustics, image filtering, lots of physics applications, especially dealing with waves and vibrations, and of course signal processing, which can be used for audio waves, seismic waves, light waves, and much more. Then the Laplace transform is mathematically very similar to the Fourier transform, actually. You will likely learn these back to back, but one thing this can do, as well as the Fourier transform, is simplify solving differential equations. Differential equations, which I said before, we have to use to represent really any complicated system and how it moves, rotates, experiences heat movement, and more. The Laplace transform can change these calculus equations essentially into an algebra equation and make the process much quicker. These are also used a lot in controls classes, where you have some system with feedback to adjust for error. One common example of this I've discussed before is cruise control in your car, where if you start going up a hill, let's say, and you slow down, your car will sense that error, then spin the wheels more to lessen that error. Now, majors that will typically learn the Fourier and Laplace transform include electrical engineers, computer engineers, mechanical engineers, aerospace engineers, chemical engineers, and physics majors. 
These aren't the only majors, but are some of the big ones that will learn these concepts. Next is complex analysis. Now math majors go into depth in this field. This is a big one for them and other majors would not go as far and honestly most won't even take this class. But I'm putting it here because physics majors and electrical engineers sometimes are required to take a course on it in undergrad. For physics majors, especially going into a theoretical field in grad school, complex analysis is one class you should take even in undergrad if you can and are not already required to. Then electrical engineers are only sometimes required to take this course. I've seen many schools where they don't have to and some where they do. But even if they have to take it, they really don't apply that much to their engineering work, especially in undergrad, at least relative to what math majors see. But the very basics are important, which is what I'll talk about. So this is basically a class about complex numbers. Complex numbers can have a real and an imaginary component. So that square root of negative one you learned in basic algebra actually does have applications, probably none of which you learned in high school. But this is not sort of useful. It's extremely important in certain fields. To put simply, the basics of why complex numbers are important, especially in engineering, is phase, as in the phase of a trig function. The only difference between these two functions is their phase, or basically a left or right shift. Now, if you've taken any trig, you may be thinking, wait, I've done phase before and it does not require using imaginary numbers. It's just putting the number that tells you how offset the graph is, which is correct. But what happens when you want to add two trig functions of different phases? Now complex numbers come in. But why do they come in? And it's because of this equation right here. This is Euler's formula, and this is basically the start of complex analysis, and it's one of the most important and famous equations you need to know. If you've heard of the famous equation that e to the pi i equals negative 1, this is where it comes from. You plug in pi for x here, so you get e to the i times pi. Then you got to plug in for all the other x's on the other side. Then cosine of pi is negative 1, sine of pi is 0, and 0 times i is just 0. And negative 1 plus 0 is negative 1, which is where that comes from. But going back to a real example, I'm not going to go into too much depth because it would take a long time. But if you plug in something like t plus 15 degrees for x, then we have e to the i times t plus 15 degrees equals cosine of those same terms plus i times sine of those same terms. So look at that. The real part of this is just this, a normal looking cosine function with some phase offset. Now if we want to add that to another cosine function with the same frequency but different phase to that real part, then we can just rewrite that using Euler's formula and that part we want to add is also the real part. So essentially, if you add these up here on the left and take the real part of them, you would find what these two added up are, which is what I said is what we wanted to do. So I'm just going to rewrite the two exponential parts you see on the left, and what I can do is distribute the i to both the inside terms. After doing that to both of them, I would get this expression. Then we have an exponent with two separate terms separated by addition. Meaning if you remember your rules of exponents, you can separate that into multiplication with e as the base and the two separate components in each of the exponents. You can do that for the other one too, and since they both have an e to the i t here, you can factor that out and the inside is something you can solve using Euler's formula, but just plugging in numbers now. Remember, I showed you with e to the i times pi, and this is just e to the i times 15 or 50. All just numbers times i in the exponent, you do it all the same way. And there's more to this and I could keep going, but I'm going to stop that example there. If you're totally confused, don't even worry, this is not something you are supposed to just get in two minutes. But everything you see on the screen is basic algebra and rules of exponents. Even though there are imaginary numbers, it's still nothing too advanced from what you've seen in normal high school math. So that's just a little peek into the math that you'll need to do. But now going into applications, again, in circuits, when you input a sinusoidal voltage, capacitors and inductors in that circuit will change the phase and the amplitude. So the math needed for this involves complex numbers. Electromagnetic waves are also sinusoidal, changing in time and position. And if you open a textbook on the subject, you'll see equations like this, which I know look weird, but look at this right here. It's Euler's formula with the angular frequency and time in the exponent rather than just x. And this weird looking R just stands for real, as in the real component of this like I showed above. And remember just a few minutes ago when I talked about the Fourier transform is all about functions being made up of sinusoids? 
Well, how you actually determine the Fourier transform of something is with this equation. But do you notice again how Euler's formula can be seen right here? And by the way, if you wanted to actually find the Fourier transform of a signal, like of my voice that I showed earlier, you'd have to plug in that function for f of t and evaluate that and you'd have your answer. And then this also applies to controls as well, like determining the stability of a system or controller design. And even in quantum mechanics, a particle can be represented by a wave-like function. And it has an equation that represents it known as the Schrodinger equation. And there's an imaginary number right there. It's not Euler's formula, and you don't even need complex analysis for this class where you see this equation, but complex analysis can still help you have a better grasp over functions like these. So yes, complex analysis can come up way more than you may realize. But complex analysis also gets way more intense. Euler's formula is like day one, and we didn't even scratch the surface. In fact, you don't even need complex analysis to learn Euler's formula, and as an electrical or maybe a computer engineer, you will learn it in one of your major classes. But in complex analysis, you can get into things you won't even hear of unless you take the class, like cauchy riemann equations, or residue, which is helpful in physics to evaluate certain integrals, like in scattering theory, which is how waves and particles scatter. But these topics are really for people who actually have to take the class, which like I said are math majors, and then some physics majors and electrical engineers. Again, you will definitely learn the basics of Euler's formula if you're an electrical engineer, physics major, or even a computer engineer, and a few others but mostly you will not have to take this entire class and see all the detail. The main people who take this class are math majors. Then the next topic is partial differential equations, which I will go through quickly because not many majors take this. Now, normal differential equations have two variables total. So like for a spring moving in one dimension, position is changing over time. Those are the two variables, and you can make an equation using those two. Then partial differential equations are for when you have more than two variables, where you see u, x, and t here. So like for an electromagnetic wave or heat transfer, these can change over x, y, z, and time. So there's lots of variables. And in this class, you'll learn methods of how to solve these. And some people argue that it is good for electrical, mechanical, or aerospace engineers to take this class because it gives that strong mathematical background on certain equations important in the field, like waves or the heat equation. But most schools don't require it for those majors, but I have heard of some taking it. Physics majors, on the other hand, are normally required to take this course because a lot of the equations they see are partial differential equations. And I'll end that video here and continue on with numerical methods and a few others in the next video. If you like this one, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you in part three.